Welcome to the Cincinnati Children's Heritage video series. This, these videos are a project of the Cincinnati Children's Historical Committee. I'm Dr. Elaine Billmeyer. I'm a retired community pediatrician and a member of the Historical Committee. With me is Bea Katz. Bea is a longtime employee of marketing and communication. Um, she's the author of a photo history of Cincinnati Children's, which was published um, on the occasion of its 125th anniversary. So our topic today is the history of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. We have three longtime faculty members who are here, Dr. Balistrieri, Dr. Hybe, Dr. Farrell. Uh, Dr. Balistrieri is the former long-term director of the uh, Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. Um, he's the co-founder of the Liver Care Center. He's currently Emeritus Director of that division and uh, Emeritus Medical Director of Liver Transplantation. And he's also been the editor of the Journal of Pediatrics since 1995. Dr. Jim Hybe is a longtime uh, director of the Clinical Research Center at Cincinnati Children's. Currently, he is the director of the Center for Clinical and Translational <laughs> Science and Training, uh, which is a collaboration of UC Cincinnati Children's, uh, UC Health, and the VA. And Dr. Mike Farrell, who has worn many hats, uh, in addition to being a longtime uh, division member, uh, he has also been Director of Residency Training, Chief of Staff, and he is currently the Chair of the Historical Committee. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Um, let's start as we always do, have each of you give us just a little thumbnail, biography, um, who you are, how you happen to come to Children's in the first place. So, so you want me to start? You want to start since <laughs> you're first I'll here, start Jim. since okay. I'm the first chair. Okay. <laughs> so I came to Children's in uh, 1975. Um, I came specifically to do a fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology, figuring that I would do two years of training and I would go back and probably practice in Indiana. Uh, that's where I did my training as a resident and my undergraduate training and medical school training. And uh, everything blew up. Uh, <laughs> the atmosphere and the environment at Children's Hospital was so different than what I was used to. There was a huge uh, uh, interest in, uh, our motto now is changing the outcome together, but I would say quite frankly, we were still, we were doing that back in the 70s. That it was, the intent was to try and find better ways to treat patients. So I got very interested in doing research. Um, I did a fair amount of clinical research and did some basic science research. And ultimately, over time, I ran the Clinical Research Center for a number of years and then graduated into a program that supports infrastructure for clinical translational research across the University and Children's Hospital. And it's been a glorious experience. Um, I've had opportunities to leave, uh, but the environment has always been so positive, I felt like it was a great place to be, and it fostered um, everything I wanted. My family grew up here. I have grandkids that live here, which is really terrific, and both my daughters live here, so it's great that I've had an opportunity to stay Excellent. in the same place Excellent. for my entire career. And we'll come back, and we want to know more in detail about <coughs> what you've been doing with Dr. Balistrieri. Uh, yes, I uh, came here as an intern mm -hmm. in 1970. <clears throat> and I did uh, a year of internship, a year of residency, and then I went to <coughs> Bill Schubert and said, I'd like to do a fellowship in GI. And <coughs> he said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, you'll, as you'll come to know, there was no, no such thing as gastroenterology yeah. back yeah. then. Uh, so I did that. I went to the Mayo Clinic for a short period, and then uh, the United States Navy called me. I was at uh, Philadelphia Navy Hospital. <clears throat> and while there, I went up to CHOP periodically out of, more out of boredom at the Navy <laughs> Hospital, and they offered me a job. I uh, stayed there for a couple of years, and Bill Schubert called and said, do you want to come back? He said, we got these two guys, Hybe and Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> I guess no. you were both fellows, uh, if I can remember. Were you a fellow in, yeah, 78? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, so you can come back and we can have they a big division. They figured out what gastroenterology yeah. <coughs> was by then, huh? Well, sort of, sort of. Yeah, all right, good, good. Mike? Well, my path is a little bit different. Uh, I grew <laughs> up in Philadelphia, <coughs> and prior to coming here, the furthest west I had been was 69th Street. That's <laughs> 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 daring. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent three years in the Navy, 
It was at the end of the Vietnam War. The draft was over. And previously, people would leave, and there'd be a re open residency slots, and there was a movement of people back and forth. But well, with the war ending, suddenly there was no market for PL2s on the <laughs> East Coast. Mm -hmm. All I knew about Cincinnati was the big red machine. <laughs> <laughs> and Clark West Group had recently published the hypocomplementemia of post uh, streptococcal glomerulonephritis. That was all I knew. My wife and I drove out here, and we met the man that changed my life. Bill Schubert. Uh, he offered me a position as a resident. I took it. Um, and when I finished the, the basic training, I really didn't know what a gastroenterologist was. <laughs> 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 I wasn't sure I wanted to be one, but I knew I wanted additional academic training. And back in those days, and I think Jim and Bill probably agree, what we called GI in the 70s was probably the as close to a general academic right. pediatrics uh, as existed in the Midwest, and that's really what I was interested in. And then Bill, in his own way, <laughs> converted me over the years, uh -huh. offered me a position, offered me a chance to work with the residents, and the rest is history. Yeah. Well, if I can interject, because yeah. gastroenterology, uh, pediatrics was really founded on the basis of gastrointestinal illnesses, malnutrition, diarrhea, those mm -hmm. are the major reasons children were dying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really, it is general pediatrics in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So really, that gets to <coughs> our next question, which is that we, I believe this is the first time in the history of the Heritage video series that we've talked to gastroenterologists. And so we wanted to start with some history about how that division came to be established. And I think we've already begun. So. Yeah, well, I, I can. I can tell you a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Bill Schubert uh, was a hematologist, mm -hmm. and he was very interested in iron absorption. And uh, then along came somewhere along the line John Parton, mm -hmm. who actually had a way to do intestinal biopsies. And then again, neither of them were gastroenterologists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the the, uh, the culture around st studying gastrointestinal histology, really GI histology, not liver. Uh, uh, grew up uh, from that genesis, and hence the, my story when I went to Bill Schubert and said I'd like to do gastroenterology, he said, really, what's that? Because there were no fellowship programs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, as time went on, you know, it, it obviously changed. And as Elaine mentioned, we now have gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition all in one very siloed d division. Mm -hmm. So as it's Bill alluded to, I think uh, at the time <coughs> when we did our training, there, most of the training programs that were, quote, GI related were for cystic fibrosis. Really? And oh. so most places did not have bona fide GI. And there was no BIRD certification back in those days. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. um, most places had sort of a hybrid where you would see GI, liver related diseases, pancreatic related diseases, mm -hmm. and um, you would be mixed up with a variety of other things. And our program was particularly um, mixed up, if you will, <laughs> from the standpoint that Bill, because of his previous experience as sort of the consultant to the community, had patients with uh, collagen vascular disease. So you're talking about Bill Schubert. Yeah. We've got two Bills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah not this Bill. Yeah. But Bill uh -huh. Schubert was in practice before he came right. to, to right. Children's, <laughs> and he developed a very robust uh, cons consultative practice of pediatrics. So he saw a huge number of a variety of diseases mm -hmm. that um, in including things that you would say like um, endocrine. Yeah, endocrine. Uh, uh, there there wasn't there wasn't there right. was an endocrinologist in private right. practice, but we would do <coughs> tests for growth hormone deficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. did a variety, you know, like we w <laughs> we became very very well trained in a variety of things <coughs> mm -hmm. that a gastroenterologist would have never been trained in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, just a little vignette about you know, what Bill would get. He called me one, one day and said. There's a child coming in, and the pediatrician thinks he may have malaria. Uh, I said, oh, has he traveled? And he said, yeah. no. <laughs> says, the usual case of malaria here is a kid from Indiana with JRA. And that was just typical of what we saw. That would come, that would come in. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. So what would lead Dr. Schubert to officially create a division? I think, th I think it was 1968, and it was one of the early divisions of gastroenterology in the country, or pediatric gastroenterology. Why did it become a division as opposed to well, whatever it had been before? Well, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 well, I think part I, of it I was wasn't the, here in '68. Part of it was to keep him here. Yeah, I, I, that could well be, yeah. and and bring him out of private practice. Uh, uh, but you know, around that time, yeah. there was a lot of activity going on that really did involve quote GI diseases. There was George Hoog studying glycogen storage diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, major progress with Kevin Bovey and Jim McAdams and George Hoog. Very interesting. In fact, it was metabolic liver disease that spurred my own personal interest. But do you want uh, to comment on how Bill got involved with liver biopsies? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So to study the liver, uh, Dick Hong, who was a, I guess he was a resident, chief resident? Resident, mm -hmm. right. And Harry Green, another chief resident, they said, we need to figure out a way to safely biopsy children. And they developed the liver biopsy technique, which was used as the standard up until the radiologists started to intervene. Published paper. So and the other piece was I think there was a very strong adult presence in hepatology here. Yes. Uh, yes. Schiff yeah. was here. The mm -hmm. Schiff textbook, which is through a gazillion iterations at Leon point. Schiff, right. And uh, Bill and Leon Schiff uh, interacted on a regular basis, and that led to identification of some novel diseases, including cholesterol ester storage disease, mm -hmm. uh, which um, uh, they actually identified a kindred of patients here and mm -hmm. evaluated. And I think Bill got very interested beyond his interest originally in iron deficiency anemia because, as Bill alluded to, uh, Bill Schubert was a hematologist. Mm -hmm. right. And he was never trained in gastroenterology. And I have to say it was kind of interesting having them be our mentors, that is Bill Schubert and John <laughs> Parton, because uh, we were sort of developing into what was the future of what gastroenterology would look like. But, but, but I don't know about you, uh, your, your fellow, but my, my fellowship was not gastroenterology. <laughs> I saw neurology, endocrinology, oh, yeah. just that. Oh, and yeah. well, that's know, why I chose it. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. And you know how many endos endoscopy yeah. is obviously a gold standard yeah. now yeah. gastro. Yeah. I did zero during my entire fellowship. Well, we didn't, I don't think, uh, I don't know whether Mike did, but I didn't, we didn't <coughs> do any until, I think the first one we did was in like 1979, yeah. down Sounds on the it. Clinical Research Center, uh -huh. which was quite an experience. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, Bill sent me out for one of the months of my second year mm -hmm. fellowship to Salt Lake City to work with John Herbst, yeah. and that was the beginning of bringing things like pH studies, some rudimentary motility. The modern era. The, yeah. the, the yeah. more modern era. But the other historical thing around the 70s was Rye syndrome. Mm. Oh, gosh, yes. And that <laughs> really drove both uh, Parton and <laughs> Schubert's um, interest. Yeah. And interestingly, the several years before the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Research Foundation, which has mandated to review uh, our research efforts periodically according to the deed of gift. But they had suggested, or I highly recommended, the institution get an electron microscope. Mm. And I'm not quite sure how the electron microscope wound up in GI uh, in the but beginning, but it was uh. down in the basement, and John Parton and his wife, Jackie, uh, with the original electron uh, microscopist. So, so, so Mike, the way that happened was that uh, Bill persuaded his family, a family member, to give that. And that's how that all developed. And uh, That's how it wound up. Well, I think it wound up partly down there because Jackie and John were down there hiding out in the basement. But they had had no training in electron. No, no, no. So, I mean, basically no. everything that came in from GI it's here was kind of really, soap. it grew up uh, as our organically, you know, and, and <coughs> no one had formal training. Research Center, which I think was <coughs> was all tied into the development oh, of GI. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's yeah. actually partly how they got Bill to come to, that is Bill Schubert, to mm -hmm. the uh, children's was this was an opportunity for him to be the program director for that because uh, in the late 50s when the NIH was created, they had this idea of developing clinical research centers throughout the country for study of disease, and this was an opportunity for him to uh, lead that. And that was totally unique. 
well, there clinical were research as opposed to bench yes, research. Yes, this was yeah. totally unique. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at that time, there were a limited number of pediatric institutions that had them. Mm -hmm. We were one of about six or eight in the country that mm -hmm. did. And mm -hmm. um, there's lots of interesting stories about that. I'm not sure that's part of this uh, heritage series, well, but there's a variety of things mm -hmm. that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, when they created this, they built the Proctor Wing there. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of which ended up being some laboratory space, but the first floor of that mm -hmm. was over the emergency room and yeah. Yeah. it included the rooms and there were six nurses mm -hmm. and a dietitian and mm -hmm. uh, Ruby Cole was there yeah. who was actually yeah. uh, a very important person and Jackie Vitterick was the original uh, nurse that ran the program there and um, it was an opportunity to bring kids in and it's quite frankly it's different than it was today. You know, we had patients there for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. I followed mm -hmm. one little years. boy. I had yeah. one little boy who was there for more than a year or mm -hmm. two years mm -hmm. when we mm -hmm. finally got him out of the hospital and home. Mm -hmm. And he's now in his 40s, and he <gasps> seems to be okay because I wow. talked to him not too long wow. ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. yeah well, we, we only have that six beds yes. down there yeah. in the yeah. CRC. Mm -hmm. But the vision mm -hmm. was there, which was really y unique when you think back on it. You know, the, you know, if you're going to improve the health of children, we need to study yeah. clinical disease. Yeah. Yeah. And if there were any fault <coughs> in the CRC at that time, it was very heavily GI related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say 75% of what was going on down there was GI related. Well, I remember going over and our kids getting, what, 72 hour stool yeah, oh specimens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, oh, I'm glad you guys are handling that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you don't really appreciate yeah, the yeah, fact that they yeah. were doing the fecal yeah. fat if, collections yeah, fecal right there. and they were measuring yeah. fecal fat right oh, there yeah. on the floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh goodness. So following mm -hmm. up on that, it was he the research was heavily GI and that was because of Dr. Schubert? I and think his he, interest played, he played a major role and mm -hmm. as Bill alluded to, uh, George Hu was very uh, involved in metabolic liver disease mm -hmm. uh, and there was he has spawned a number of people that really were interested in mm -hmm. gastrointestinal diseases. And so mm -hmm. I think that's what um, made it so heavily weighted towards GI disease. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Can so we talk about liver? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, <laughs> this is in, within my memory as an employee of Children's, uh, the establishment of the Pediatric Liver Care Center. Correct. And I know it was one of the first really collaborative and comprehensive mm -hmm. programs. So we wanted to get some of that history. And yeah. How did it come about? And well, again, organically uh, in many ways, because uh, the field of pediatric hepatology was sort of evolving around one person. That was Tom Starzl in Pittsburgh, because mm -hmm. he was doing this thing called liver transplant. <coughs> mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in other centers, including my own uh, ex experience at CHOP, we had children dying, 11 and 12, 13 children per year mm -hmm. because of liver disease. So uh, the goal was to establish a liver care center that would allow not only patient care, but research and training. And uh, Bill Schubert said, okay, get together with development, start raising money. And, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and, and so it was Fred Reichman and I, and. Uh, Again, we were successful in raising money, establishing the program, and, mm -hmm. and then saying, now we got to start doing liver transplants. Again, none of us had had training at mm -hmm. all. So Fred Reichman took, took his experience to the dog lab uh, on uh, Petey, okay. little Petey, uh -huh. and uh, perfected uh, the operation very quickly. He was a tremendous uh, technician, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of it is history. Yeah, we, yeah. we established the program yeah. in 85. Can you explain what made that program unique, the, the collaborative Well, center? I think it was unique in that uh, it really involved something called a pediatric hepatologist, which of course was totally unheard of in, in, in at that time. So in the other center, Starzl Center, actually employed pediatricians uh -huh. to take care of the post-op oh. patients. Mm -hmm. uh, Basil Zatelli, a good friend of ours, and uh, for example. so. Uh, the program was really co-directed co by a pediatric hepatologist, myself and Fred Reichman, a pediatric surgeon. Mm -hmm. And because uh, we knew it was an on-the-job learning and it was going to be a very steep learning curve. So, mm -hmm. so 
<coughs> thinking, and, and to emphasize what Bill said, we, they, they, this was really a team effort. Mm -hmm. It included mm -hmm. not just the pediatric hepatologist and the surgeon, but also the dietitian, mm -hmm. the nursing mm -hmm. staff, so, uh, social workers, mm -hmm. the psychologist. Mm -hmm. So it actually was a multidisciplinary group that actually was, from our perspective, pretty unique. And still, many centers don't have a program quite like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you, you talk to many of my, our now, of course, there is a boarded pediatric hepatology, <laughs> and uh, it's still siloed. This, in some centers, actually, the surgery is done at a different hospital, and then the patient is transferred OG. over. OG. So, uh, but that's, Jim well, is exactly right. Yeah. That philosophy holds today. We meet once a week mm -hmm. with everyone of the same discipline that Jim talked about. You can get some sense of the history by just looking at the name of the division over time. <laughs> because we started out as the what division are we call of you? gastroenterology, mm -hmm. yeah. then became the division of gastroenterology when hepatology mm -hmm. became so complicated that mm -hmm. nobody could do it all. And then as nutrition advances, we became and nutrition. So now we're the division of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition. Mm -hmm. So and we're, 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 yeah. we're, res we are, we're resisting pancreatology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> pancreatologists would that. love to have the name have of our national name organization on. put in as P within the national oh, organization. NASPIGAN, which is the North American Society yeah, that's right, for Pediatric own. Gastrology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. It'd like to sli well, slide a P well, in there. Well, then you need an acronym or something. Yeah, yeah. But you have a lot of collaborative, multidisciplinary programs within oh, GI now. You want any of them that you want to talk about in particular? Mike, you should talk about nutrition because, mm -hmm. you know, Mike really uh, mm -hmm. took a major role in that mm -hmm. uh, at a time when, again, hospitalists, nutritionists uh, were not very well uh, described. Man. And when we, um, when I got interested <coughs> in the, the mid-70s, Bill Schubert with one of the pharmacists at Brissy had yeah. kind of had a homemade recipe for TPN. <laughs> uh, and, but there was really no systematic uh, treatment of the kids or monitoring for complications. Mm -hmm. um, and we would see an awful lot of kids who were severely malnourished because their docs didn't know about nutrition or we'd see mm -hmm. lots of complications and we got consulted mm -hmm. at the very end. So Bill asked if uh, Joe Fisher had come to the university as uh, head of surgery and he had done a lot of pioneering work at Mass General. Mm -hmm. um, so Bill asked if we could copy some of that and develop a pediatric mm -hmm. uh, nutrition support mm -hmm. service. Now, personally, that fit with my idea of I still wanted to see a little bit of everything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So when I started doing, and we were just starting bone marrow transplants, so mm -hmm. uh, it was the opportunity to see mm -hmm. kids with all kinds of diseases yeah. and um, take care of their nutrition, and it just evolved yeah. over the years. So I wanted to ask yeah, go ahead. about yeah. the feral bag. <laughs> because I'm sure that not many people who see no. our video will know who no. created the feral bag. Well, first of all, I didn't create it. Uh, my name got put on it, but it really was a team effort of the nutrition support team um, back in those days. And its main reason was hygienic, uh, that we put these tubes in kids and if they weren't running their feeds in, they were left open, they became mm -hmm. unclogged. Mm -hmm. If the child began to vomit, the tube would back up and it was just a, a bloody mess. So mm -hmm. first of all, it was hygienic to develop it a, a closed system. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the opportunity to, as we began to use intestinal feedings mm -hmm. rather than stomach feedings to uh, relieve pressure as mm -hmm. needed. And some, mm -hmm. Bill, I mean, Jim will remember some of the kids with uh, chronic pseudo obstruction we had down on the CRC mm -hmm. forever and all the jury rigged. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had pictures of some yeah, of those probably. things we <laughs> jury rigged to try and decompress well, the kids. I was, I was just saying, didn't the Herps board come when he was here? Well, Herps here? was a, resi yeah, he was a resident here. Right. Yeah. And then went out to Salt Lake mm -hmm. and he developed this 
Herb's board, which okay, he didn't develop it here. Uh, I, thought he I can best describe it as a rocket yeah. launcher. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> you put the kid on this forty-five degree well, angle board <laughs> and, ta and tape them in place. Yeah. And yeah. the idea was gravity would help prevent. Yeah. Uh, but what I think what you're hearing is, you know, that this field evolved as, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. That's what it sounds like. You know, making yeah. it up as you go along. I mean, Ed Brissy, who he mentioned, mm -hmm. I, I remember a little guy that was not doing very well, and so Bill Schubert said, "Why don't you, why don't you figure out what's going on with this guy?" So mm -hmm. we sent Serum down to Kettering Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And they did heavy metal analyses, uh, part of uh, just as part of the protocol. Yeah. And the child was zinc deficient. Mm -hmm. So Ed Brissy, we uh, said, Ed, we got to give this kid some zinc. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he made up, he made it up in a hood, <laughs> and, and that was the state of the art. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, in the, the early TPNs weren't kids getting hepatitis, or I mean, uh, uh, well, not not the infection, not hepatitis, but I mean, hepatitis, but in fact, cholestasis. Uh, yeah, it was cholestasis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. But the original solutions were not amino acid based. They were actually a hydrolysate, which was probably one of the hepatotoxic um, agents, all kinds of deficiencies. For years, the field was plagued with the concept that if some is good, more is better. And we actually uh -huh. yeah. metabolically overfed. Um, some of these children, particularly with lipid solutions. And, 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 and the other mentality was, Intravenous feeding is the yeah. way to go. Yeah. When in fact, you know, we're we're meant to be fed orally. Yeah. 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 The interesting thing is, when I was a fellow, we were still using interlipid, which was the first oh, of, yeah. of yeah. the lipid <coughs> uh, solutions that you give. And we now have learned that it's probably one of the agents that was <laughs> causing liver toxicity. <laughs> Oops. Although, in fairness, liver toxicity occurred before interlipid was right. available right. in the right. country. So, yeah. you know. It, was a, probably a combination of our. Uh, we're making it sound like we were all three at James Garfield's bedside <laughs> 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 as he struggled for those seventy-something days. Yes. But it was it was that primitive. There's no question. We didn't use one of those X-ray machines that he that they cooked up. Thomas Edison. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a story. I remember some kids with. Well, I mean, there's still a short gut, but I remember on two. South. 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 There was one kid, and I think he was post volvulus, literally yeah. had a short gut. Yep. Yep. And then there was a little girl who nothing went through her gut. I won't say well, her name. Sure. Sure. You know what I'm talking sure. about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. We know who all so the you know, <laughs> you know, remember all their names. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> they were all in one room. Yeah, yeah they, they were. Yeah. The, oh. th the, piece, the other piece was there used to be a room up on five mm -hmm. before the ICU went there that mm -hmm. they called the Rose Room. Yeah. <laughs> and there were all these kids who uh -huh. had um, basically they'd exhausted most of their line sites and there wasn't uh -huh. much you could do for them. Uh. Yeah, back then. So, uh, how, how is the management of that sort of thing changed? You have a sent. You have a. a, a oh, division we have a whole for that. Yeah. Well, first of all, the name's been changed. It's yeah. now intestinal rehabilitation. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so you don't want to. Yeah, no short gut. No, okay. no, no short okay. gut or okay. short bowel. Yeah. Um, but, to, but the field has advanced a lot. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot more about uh, intestinal adaptation mm -hmm. than we knew back in the 70s. We mm -hmm. pre were pretty clueless. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things we were clueless about was giving nutrients to the gut actually stimulates right. growth of the gut. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the dogma at that time was, so, oh, don't give them anything. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> have that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that no. was a, a disease that's d essentially disappeared but that we all spent a lot of time in our fellowships. It was intractable diarrhea yeah, yeah. of infancy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which probably in retrospect was, had a huge atrogenic component. Because they weren't fed. The or child or had fed a limited rotavirus diet. probably, but uh -huh. then was starved. Um, and it was, you know, was not uncommon to put the child at bowel rest. Yeah. Uh, I always had visions so, of, for bowel rest, I yeah. had to remove the intestine and put it in its own little yeah, bed cool. uh, <laughs> for a, a period of time. And it took us a long time to... So you're saying that's pretty much disappeared. Standard. Then, everybody yeah. gets oh, yeah. fed I mean, everybody something. gets fed. Oh, but, yeah. but there still are patients yeah. that have very severe resections yeah. and have yeah. motility disorders that yeah. uh, ultimately are the fraction of patients that come to transplantation sometimes. Mm -hmm. But even the number of total number of patients who 
come to intestinal transplantation has declined a great deal because mm -hmm. we've become much more sophisticated in how we manage these patients. Mm -hmm. The other complication that we didn't appreciate was you had to feed an infant or they would not develop feeding skills. Mm -hmm. And we thought and nothing. language skills. Yeah, and we thought oh. nothing of putting a neonate on TPN for six months, uh -huh. uh, and then you'd mm -hmm. hand them a bottle and, <laughs> and they look go, at you like, what am I supposed <laughs> to do with this? Uh -huh. And then it would be months of speech and occupational mm -hmm. therapy to mm -hmm. rehabilitate them. And I uh, remember girls in their teenage years, survivors of this, who still couldn't eat normally. Yeah, I, the concept there was is, no is, guidelines. The concept yeah. is across medicine now. You know, you need to let the body do its physiologic function. Mm -hmm. For example, orthopedists, mm -hmm. they're not going to let you lay in bed three months yeah. after a right. knee or a hip. They're going to get you up that, that right. same day. Right. Yeah. And right. it's the same thing with the gut. you got to make it work. Yeah. The feeding team, that's part of your division. Yes. Uh, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> they, they deal more with, well, a real range of kids with mm -hmm. significant RO, uh, pharyngeal motor skill mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to kids who are just picky eaters mm. and anxious parents. Yeah. But uh, it's a multi, well, that's the other thing. Just about all our programs are multidisciplinary mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. now. And that evolved from the aerodigestive center yeah. Yeah. in many ways. Mm -hmm. The uh. I mean, Even our abdominal pain clinic now has uh, Motility uh, experts, GI, nutrition, mm -hmm. psychology mm -hmm. um, embedded in it. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's one of the unique things about Cincinnati. We mm -hmm. talked about it in yeah. regards to liver, mm -hmm. and that is the ability of other divisions to interact at, at, a, at a very intricate level. Mm -hmm. uh, the Aerodigestive Center, which I mentioned, was Robin Cotton working with mm -hmm. GI, Colin Rudolph, and some others. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's, that's across the center. You know, we have. I can get, name several other, you know, the surgeons in the pancreas, mm -hmm. the cardiologists and, and uh, the post-Fontan clinic, mm -hmm. just the mentality of Children's Hospital, which I think is and very, very is unique. unique. It's that. very unique. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm sure Jim and Mike talk to their colleagues in other centers mm -hmm. and they hear the same thing, you know, I can't, I can't get them to, to do this. Or, mm -hmm. or they're not uh, interested. Sure. Or, uh, yeah, interesting. Fabulous. Interesting. So this is sort of a switch of topic, but I can't not ask mm -hmm. about bile acids because mm -hmm. both of you have been <laughs> Okay, I'll leave now. <laughs> yeah, please. At least for, for part of our conversation. It's important to remember, well, actually, when I was a fellow, you know, obviously Bill was interested in bile acids before I came. But, but it was I, the same patient. It was the yeah. same patient. Yeah. So That's how long this kid was in the hospital. The, the oh interesting thing is, was I was interviewed back in the day when I was a fellow about my research because I don't know how this all evolved, but somebody thought this was an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And so they sent somebody out from the Enquirer to interview me and went <laughs> through this long discussion about bile acids. And the, ultimately the article was published in the paper and it was, it was bio acids. Bio acids. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so it did start with this young guy from Tennessee who had intractable diarrhea. And uh, again, Schubert, in his inimitable way, said, figure out what's going on with this guy. Because he'd already been in for several months, failing to thrive. Uh, out of desperation, we contacted a guy named Alan Hoffman at the Mayo Clinic and said, you know, could bile acids be playing a role? Because that can cause diarrhea. He said, I don't know, why don't you come up here to the Mayo Clinic and we'll figure it out. And uh, that, that led to continuing interest Jim picked up on it because this little guy was still in the hospital, <laughs> despite the fact that we now knew what he had, bile acid and malabsorption. And then uh, at CHOP, the interest in bile acids expanded with the internal medicine group there, and it became clear that they not only are important in intestinal disease, but clearly play a role in liver disease. And, and of course, again, the rest is history. Now we know many defects and also many other diseases like uh, bile or dis disease and so on, that, which bile acids play so, a role. So one of, the, one of the fortuitous things that happened, <coughs> we recruited Ken Suchel yes. from mm -hmm. England, and he was a world-class steroid, steroid chemist and had offered an opportunity for us to actually build a program where we could identify and define <coughs> 
new diseases that cause liver disease associated with bile acid synthetic defects. And so over time, we've had an opportunity to study a lot of those kids and ultimately develop therapy and basically have cured them mm -hmm. and brought a drug to market for treatment of those patients. So it's been a very interesting experience. But you know, our, our research in liver disease is much broader than that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole variety of areas that we work in. Uh, but we were very interested in bile acid transport back in the 70s and early 80s. And Bill's been very interested in, in hepatitis for a long period of time. And um, we now are very involved with organoids and we interact with the folks in the Customs Center. Uh, I think we need to define yes, the word organoids. Oh, organoids, <laughs> organoids are uh, basically structures that are created either from pluripotential stem cells. Small uh, stem organs. Cells, <laughs> yeah. uh, little Baby organs. organs. Little, little organs. Little organs. Okay. Uh, or you can make them from intestine and you can create um, a, an atmosphere just like the gastrointestinal tract or the liver in vitro. You can do it with pancreas, esophagus, almost everything. They even do it with brain now. So there's a whole variety of things that they can do. So that can be used both for developing artificial organs as time goes on or to study a disease process in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a laboratory. So it's really a major, oh, you really can, major you advance. You can take an organoid that was created from a normal person, uh -huh. actually make it so it has a mutation in a gene, just like a patient you might have, or you could take material from a patient and raise it in the test tube mm -hmm. and then be able to study it in the test tube. But again, this, 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 speaks, <laughs> this speaks to the uniqueness at no, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Well, well, we're, <coughs> we're, one, we're one, of the, one of the centers that's probably at the mm -hmm. forefront of this. Jim mm -hmm. Wells uh, mm -hmm. and Aaron Zorn have been people that have actually pioneered this, uh, and a guy named Jason Spence. And, and Taka, of course. And Taka, and now Taka, who's in our division. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think those folks have actually been very, very instrumental in developing the field. And, and, and again, I'll say it, only I think that could only happen, or most likely to happen at Cincinnati Children's Hospital because of the resource. For example, Ken Satchel, yeah. $300,000 mass spectrometer. You can't go to your chair in any other program and say, <laughs> yeah. gee, I'd like to, I'd like I'd to like buy to a mass those. spectrometer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and guess how many we have now? 14 <coughs> aspect problems. Oh so they do a huge <coughs> spectrum of diseases. And they cost more than 300,000. Yeah, they cost more than 300. And part of it is the vision of the institution to see this mm -hmm. as important areas to drive money into to do research. Yeah. 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 There's one topic I'd kind of like to switch because it also makes us unique. I mean, Bill and Jim are describing earth-shattering research and the the future, but the hospital and the division have not forgotten the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was, again, one of Bill Schubert's mantras. Right. Mm. But um, back in the day, when <laughs> our week was Tuesday morning, you went to Grand Rounds. After ra Grand Rounds, you went up and you did your liver biopsies and your intestinal biopsies, and you had a clinic on Friday. And we all went to the one clinic. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't until the early 80s that we began having more clinics. Mm -hmm. we, there was no concern about what the weight was. <laughs> because if, there were, if the community pediatrician were really concerned, he'd just admit the kid <laughs> and uh, get a consult. Yeah. Obviously, medicine changed. But in the 80s, uh, Mason opened. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can claim to be the wanderer in, in the division. Uh, I was the first one to wander away from Friday and had a Monday <laughs> clinic <Wow. laughs> instead of uh, Friday. And uh, I want to identify who the chief of the division was at the time, uh, but he thought I was nuts for doing that. Um, and then we went up to Mason. I and thought you were nuts, period. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> nothing to do with the clinic. <laughs> and um, now we're in seven sites, mm -hmm. and we've, through the years, have had affiliations with UK um, and other institutions. Um, run a clinic out in Portsmouth once a month. Um, and we've been tried to be as available to, to the community as we are to 
someone from X who yeah. needs a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's that yeah. dual mission that has made us yeah, unique. That's a, a very good point, yeah. yeah. He's still getting a lot of abdominal pain referrals. Uh, yes. Oh, even <laughs> I, in spite of... I think it's getting worse. <laughs> S the well, societal well, stresses. I would say that we, <laughs> we know what the causes are, and it's not GI most of the time. And, and there's one other aspect that I think really would resonate with everybody, and that is we are in a massive epidemic of childhood obesity. Mm. And our division, is, uh, uh, yeah. un especially yeah. under G Georgie Bezerra's leadership recently, mm. has really tried to address that, not mm. only by developing uh, nutritionists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but also folks who are looking at the downstream, unfortunately, mm -hmm. downstream consequences, mm -hmm. which is fatty liver. Yeah. But that's, that's mm -hmm. a good example <coughs> of the divisions seeing a problem, yeah. the institutions seeing a problem, and beginning to respond, because Stavros mm -hmm. really identified as a problem when she was a fellow. Sure. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But working with the community folks, Bob Shapiro and yeah. uh -huh. some, of, yeah. some of the others, uh, yeah. Uh, folks here at Children's, major problem. So the other piece we should probably address is our legacy in terms of training. Yes, yes. That was yes. one of our yes. Been, yes. Good, thank you for bringing that up. We have been really, yeah. really, I think, quite successful mm -hmm. in training young physicians who have pursued careers in, in pediatric GI, mm -hmm. many of whom are in leadership positions mm -hmm. and have been mm -hmm. very successful in terms of not only patient care, teaching, but also in research. So. Mm -hmm. I am particularly proud of many of our trainees yeah. who have been successful over the years. Yeah. Can you tell us? Well, there's some great examples. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, in my vintage time, um, folks like Fred Succi, who uh, was uh, initially was the division head at uh, Yale and then the chair at Sinai and now uh, until recently has been the director of research mm -hmm. at Denver Children's or Colorado Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Sokol. Pre Fred was president yeah. of president was ASLD and, and Aspigan. Yeah. Uh -huh. And And uh, similarly, Ron Sokol was approximately the same vintage. Um, Ron has um, been very successful as division head in GI at Denver, and he's also some kind of associate chancellor or some crazy thing which <laughs> I can't keep track of, but mm -hmm. uh, he's been the president of a uh, ASLD in Aspigan. And um, there's a lot of other, Dave Grimms, who's the chair down in, uh, in uh, Mobile, uh, Mitch Cohen, who's the chair mm -hmm. at uh, UAB. Uh, John Bancroft. John Bancroft, mm -hmm. who's at Maine. And there's, we've had really, really been very successful. And we've had a number of um, faculty or fellows who actually have become faculty and have had great you know, research careers. So uh, we, I, I'd say we are one of the stellar programs that in training in pediatric GI. And not to say, you know, we're number one by U.S. News and World Report, well, but there's more to it than that. There's a lot at least that we've done. Two, yeah. yeah, we're at least, yeah. <laughs> and I would <laughs> guesstimate we're probably up around 150 uh, Great. graduates. Yeah, I was going to say, how yeah. big is the program now? How many fellows? Yeah, we have 12 GI fellows, four and four at each of the three years that are required. Mm -hmm. And then we've established fourth year fellowships. Uh. <coughs> Again, the American Board of Pediatrics calls these Certificate of Added Qualifications, Transplant Hepatology. Mm -hmm. We also have one in Nutrition, Motility, and uh, something in IBD, but I'm not really sure it's a formalized program. It's not official. <coughs> uh, okay. But, uh, so we're getting probably close to 50 years of having a fel uh, some kind of a fellowship. Right. Because you were probably not the first quote, quote <laughs> fellow First GI fellow, but they had uh, <laughs> yeah they had somebody doing an electron we're micron. Pretty, we're pretty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and that's a long time. That's yeah. fifty years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Well, at least go back to seventy two. That's when Bobo started. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they had some sort of informal fellows even before, before yeah. that point in time. So you're talking at least fifty years and for. Started out with one a year, and then with the two a year, three a year, and now it's <coughs> uh, four yeah. a year. Yeah. So it's a, so, yeah. it's a large number of 
you, if you look at the tree of pediatric gastroenterology, <laughs> um, we're one of the major trunks. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it, sound, it sounds. Yeah, it's like easy it. to go like to it. our yeah. national planning meeting for our annual meeting for NASPIC, which is our national organization, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. identify yeah. folks from all over the place it's that you, you know everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's great. That's must be great. very gratifying. Yeah. 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 yeah, as you were describing, this was kind of built from nothing. Yeah. Well, the whole field was, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know. So it's you know we're, we're not we're not much different in that regard from other centers that establish programs because the the mantra was mm -hmm. <coughs> if you didn't have a GI program you mm -hmm. you wanted one if you had mm -hmm. two gastroenterologists you wanted four if you had yeah. four you <laughs> wanted eight yeah. uh -huh. and now you know oh. you got divisions that have thirty and forty yeah. gastroenterologists. Yeah, but if you go back to the origins of our division at that time back in the seventies, uh, in the, probably the late sixties there were not specialists in a variety of areas. So mm -hmm. there was no yeah. ID specialist. Yeah. There was no mm -hmm. in-house endocrinologist. <coughs> right. There was right. no in-house rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go down the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There obviously was cardiology because Sam Kaplan had developed mm -hmm. a terrific well, at program. At that time, the only board subspecialties were cardiology and neonatology. Yeah. 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 And there really? Was a, and there was I'm a surprised very to hear neonatology that early. Yeah, there was, was a very uh -huh. well-established neonatology program. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, Jim Sutherland ran right. that. Right. And there was, uh, but if you look around, and hematology was well developed. Yeah. Because B. Yeah. Lampkin yeah. Yeah. was, and, 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 I, and I think yeah. about all these people <coughs> who were the kings and the queens yeah. back <laughs> in the day. Yeah. And yeah. you know, one of the experiences I remember very well was it used to be on Saturday morning, all the kings and queens <laughs> would be in the doctor's dining area <laughs> in the old hospital, and they yeah. would all sit around and talk about. It. And I, I think lunch was a buck. Yeah. And everybody, everybody would talk about cases and things that we don't actually do anymore. Uh, it's just we don't yeah. have the time mm -hmm. or the interactions yeah. to do that. And anybody could come in and ask them a question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah Clark Clark The only West. problem is you got five opinions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clark West and Sam Kaplan and George Benz, you know, you can just go through the litany of But people. there was no such thing as evidence-based <laughs> 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 it, uh, it was all based upon what our experience yeah. was. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, I saw one of those. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, you talk Clark West was not a trained pediatric nephrologist. No, right, no. right. <coughs> I'm not sure what the training of somebody like Jim Sutherland, who you mentioned, was. Sam Kaplan, uh, I mean, you, you, you Jim know, got the sent to Boston for like six months. And that yeah. is, that yeah. Yeah. To learn what I there was I think Sam was, was an adult trained cardiologist. That sounds yeah. about right. That, that would yeah, and in fact, yeah. the few pe mm -hmm. people that were doing co pediatric GI had worked with internists, mm -hmm. Marvin right. Ament and. Right. Uh, Richard Grand and some of those folks, right. they trained with internists, yeah. mm -hmm. the people that we uh, were following. So what are you all <coughs> doing now? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing emeritus by some names. Here. I'm well, not well you're not emeritus <laughs> yet. yet, yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you what can I'm doing now. Tell you what I, yes. Uh -huh. um, I am doing a modest amount of research. Mm -hmm. Mostly I'm a scum-sucking administrator. Uh, <laughs> I run a large grant program that mm -hmm. supports infrastructure for the university and for children's, mm -hmm. and um, that's a program that occupies about 50 plus percent of my time. Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of other uh, research-related activities that I'm doing and some clinical. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I do spend a fair amount of time interacting with people mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So people come to my office and want to know. Sometimes they come and say, "What do you know who does this? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or uh -huh. they come and say, I'm having this problem. What can uh -huh. I do uh -huh. to, to overcome this problem? So mm -hmm. that's a lot of my time is uh -huh. spent doing things like uh -huh. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Bill? So, yeah, I, uh, I got a great life right now. <laughs> I, have no, I have no administrative <laughs> <laughs> except for the Journal of Pediatrics, and yeah, we've got well. a tremendous staff that uh, really uh, uh, removes all the headaches. Uh, 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 I have two, uh, two liver clinics per week, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I have about 25, 30 percent of my funding through, as Jim mentioned, my, our research in viral hepatitis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And mm -hmm. of course, we're involved yeah. in the still involved in the transplant. That's yeah. the only yeah, no. involved <coughs> How in many liver trans transplants. A year we're doing now? about. <coughs> <coughs> we've surpassed uh, 700 in the history of the, uh -huh. of the hospital, uh -huh. and we do about 20 to 25 uh, uh -huh. liver transplants uh -huh. per year. And 
I was going to say, what's the success rate? And <coughs> then I'd have to ask you how you measure that. But right. Well, uh, one year and five year survival okay. <coughs> are the mm -hmm. standard uh, measures. And, mm -hmm. and we're well above uh, in the 95% range for one year graft mm -hmm. and patient survival and, uh, and similar numbers. Because mm -hmm. if they get past one year, it's really 95% five ah, year. Right. Yeah. But there's still, uh, still mm -hmm. hurdles that we need to overcome. And mm -hmm. Are, are uh, most of them um, uh, <coughs> related donors or? No, or no, we, we, we are, we're trying to enhance that, <coughs> living related donors, because mm -hmm. there's not enough uh, cadaveric donors yeah. to go around. But mm -hmm. uh, it's a s very small percentage, probably. Oh, okay. So probably uh, one to two per yeah, year. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. we'd like to enhance that. Okay, because with kids, you can do you part can. of the. Oh, yeah, you, you, exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. You'll never quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave up administration. <laughs> uh, I'm doing three to four <laughs> clinics a week, mm -hmm. general GI. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have a lament, it's I fear that as we become super specialized, we're losing our core, our, our mm -hmm. foundation. Mm -hmm. um, what made us, you know, what we are. Mm -hmm. Nobody can know everything uh, yeah. today, but I, when I have fellows and or residents in the clinic, I just try and teach them the basics. Mm -hmm. um, as you alluded to, I, we are overrun with functional abdominal <laughs> complaints uh, today. That's I'm not funny. sure the pathophysiology is any different than it was mm -hmm. 34 years ago, mm -hmm. but both the expression mm -hmm. in the child and the parental expectations mm -hmm. are uh, off the wall. Uh -huh. It is not unusual for a family to come in with a Google printout. Ah, uh, sure. 23 and Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh -huh. you've all had very long careers uh -huh. here, and uh -huh. we wanted to give you a chance both to talk about why you stayed. I'm sure you had opportunities to go elsewhere. And also, what do you look back on um, with the most satisfaction that you've achieved? Well, let, let me pick up on something yeah. Jim said earlier. You know, when I first came to Cincinnati, coming from New York, everybody said, how are we going to get in touch with you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> Pony Express. Pony Express. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but it's, been, it's been a tremendous, it's not only a, t a tremendous children's hospital and, yeah. and the environment mm -hmm. and, the, and the people, mm -hmm. but a community in which to live. They've very, been very supportive. And I mentioned the fundraising efforts for the Liver Care Center. Yeah. It was wow. absolutely amazing, and we still see that. But it's also been great for, for raising our children. Mike's son is a pediatric gastroenterologist. My <laughs> son's a gastroenterologist. One of Jim's daughters is, a, is an uh, ENT physician at Children's Hospital. So I think, you know, I think that speaks very well for the ability of a community like this to not only sustain the, uh, the excellence, but also to, to keep that culture ingrained. And I, and I would say the reason, probably one of the major reasons I've always stayed here was it had an incredibly nurturing environment. It had, from, a, from, the seat, from the research foundation perspective, with input from the hospital, very forward-looking, thoughtful approaches so that all of the infrastructure you need to be successful to do research mm -hmm. is here. And I tell people, jokingly when they come, because I interview a lot of people that come for faculty that are interested in clinical or translational research. I said, you know, like, this is a place where if you fail here, it's your fault. <laughs> it's not because it's a lack of support for research activities mm -hmm. for individuals. And I think the clinical program has actually been absolutely fabulous because, again, there's been a very conscious effort to support the needs of the community. And you, you ask, well, what do I remember the most about things? I remember the days when the uh, clinicians from the community used to come in and we would see them and we would talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy yeah. do that, no doing question. that. Yeah. And it's yeah. largely gone now because it's yeah. been um, s um, basically consumed by, or subsumed by the hospitalists. So I, I, I like going to Grand Rounds because I see all the, yeah. all the geezers there sitting in the front row, and they're all people that I work with. Yeah. Yeah. But that culture of community really goes back to 100 years to the, to the donation to mm -hmm. the Children's Hospital, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the original contribution. And, and that, 
blanket allowed, when I was division director, allowed you to develop a, a, you know, a package to recruit great individuals and more importantly to retain great individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, <coughs> my personal statement when I applied for the residency said I plan to finish two years of pediatric residency and return to the East mm -hmm. to practice general pediatrics in a mid-sized community. <laughs> I was 0 for 3. The reason I stayed was what Jim and Bill have alluded to, but it was also the opportunity Bill gave me to be involved in teaching mm -hmm. in residence. I think one of my, one of my <coughs> proudest of is literally, it's probably in the thousands now of residents, students, and uh, fellows I've had some interaction with and I've had, hopefully have passed down the legacy of uh, the mentors that I benefited from. Mm -hmm. And it was a great place to, to live and I don't mm -hmm. regret a day of it. Fabulous. Except Excellent. when it's zero degrees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah Except for that. Yeah, yeah okay. I think that has been, that, that's another great point. I, I can't tell you how many times people come up and say, I remember you told me, <laughs> God, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you never know when that influence ends. That's you know, great. Mm -hmm. and that's, that, great and that, that's what keeps yeah. us inspired. Well, I have to tell you something weird that you said that because my daughter was on call. <coughs> I think last weekend for PZMT, and a pediatrician called and said, are you Jim Hybe's daughter? <laughs> and he went into this diet and says, your dad is why I went into pediatrics. Aww, that's <laughs> sweet, that's great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, thank Good. you so much. Thank this you so much. So this has been great. It's, yeah. always, it's always fun to tell old stories. Once, <coughs> we, once we stop recording, you have to tell me what happened to some of these kids from, from yeah. way back. Yeah. It's amazing right, the synapses yeah. are still oh, working here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're firing strong. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thank All you right, for doing this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right.